It's been nearly two years since I arrived in the little farm town of Winder, Georgia, and met the charismatic and one-of-a-kind enigma that is Stony Burt. I really had no idea what was in store for me, or how much meeting this man would change my life. But it did. Not only was I going to be fortunate enough to tell the story that is, by all accounts, a true piece of the history of the American South, for better or worse, but I'd also end up playing a small role in a genuine turning point in this man's complicated life. Stoney and I still keep in touch regularly, and I even stop by the Rock Solid Distillery from time to time to check in on him and the family. I made one such visit in March of this year, and Stoney shared with me how drastically his life has changed since the release of the podcast. Since last time I saw you, before, people ride by and wait, and I think, how friendly. Now, people come from every state they are, and when they walk in the door, I sit in their eyes. They know me. They're not scared of me. They adore me like a teddy bear, not like a lover boy. It's the most wonderful feeling I ever had. I did not know people viewed me as maybe a danger. If you don't know it, you don't know it. I thought I was sort of recluse, I'm just me, you know. It's so liberating to have people walk in and automatically like you. That's the greatest gift it's given me. And it's wonderful to have friends instead of people who want to wave. You know what I'm saying? You'd have to be me to know that, but it feels wonderful. That's all I tell you on that. Can't get no more words for it. Stoney has drastically cut back on smoking cigarettes and doesn't really drink except for when entertaining guests at the distillery on the weekends. He seems happier and healthier than I've ever seen him. He's even lost a little weight, though he's still got those giant hands of his. And another thing, Bartending, <laughs> big hands are not a help. People laugh like hell when I turn three glasses over. <laughs> and I do it regularly. My little waitress, she shakes her head. I have to shake ladies' hands now, not just men, ladies. I try to explain to them, you're a smaller man than me. My, my hands might seem bigger than you. They won't have it. They must have Andre Design's hands. <laughs> it's amazing the power of suggestion. Now, my hand, not Andre the Giant, it's Mac Lee and Billy Burke combined, my grandpa and Billy Burke, and a little bit of Hegwood. But you have made him Andre the Giant, and I'm stuck with it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> it's kind of become a thing for people to come in and hold their hand up to his to see how big they really are. I told him that if someone comes into the distillery with hands bigger than his, they might deserve a drink on the house. As for the booming business at the distillery itself that Stoney and his son Stone built together? Tell you the truth, ain't not a day that goes by that I look up, how you like me now, Dad? <laughs> uh, everything here reminds me of in Stone. And this time we spent together allowed me to teach him what my other grandpa, Mac Lee, the one that was with my daddy when he shot his first two men. It got me two years, night and day with Stone, and I didn't really... Pre-plan that, but it happened. I wouldn't take a million dollars for that. Now that kid can build a bar or anything else you see, we done. If I had my time to go over, somebody had did not loan me, give me a million dollars, I'd done it this way. The two years it took. How do I feel? I'm about as proud as a peacock. But something's different. I wake up feeling like the sun's rising and I'm watching it eat with my eyes closed. That's how I feel. Every day. In fact, to say that the little distillery is busy would be a bit of an understatement. The somewhat shy and reserved Stone Bird, or Stoney Jr. as some know him, took a break from making whiskey to tell me just how much he's seen things change in the past year. Uh, it, 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 it's changed uh, everything about this uh, distillery. What we started out was we wanted just to keep the family recipe alive and and uh, we were gonna stay small and craft, and like uh, we had no idea that we were gonna have a podcast. But since the podcast, it's, it's changed my life. It's, it's, it's humbling, is what it is. People come in here and talk, and uh, to me, you know, watching my dad, how this podcast has actually helped him. It's like a, it's a weight lifted off of him. 
And uh, so I'd say that podcast has changed my life and uh, in a good way. And as far as the distillery goes, it made it basically successful overnight. I mean, I can't keep up with all the demand that's out there right now. And uh, I mean, it, it's, I'm gonna keep on trying, but it's crazy, it's crazy. People have come from every corner of the United States, California, Texas, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New York, to visit the distillery. Not only to try the whiskey that Stoney claims is the best you've ever had, bar none, but more so just to meet Stoney himself. And while at first I was completely amazed to hear this, the more I thought about it, the more it made sense to me. In the eight or nine months since the release of the final episode, Something miraculous has happened. And I don't say this to ring my own bell at all. It's not anything that Stoney nor I would have ever expected. In fact, there was a time when we were both pretty nervous about how people would react to hearing his story. But along the way, people seem to have bonded and related to Stoney and his story. I've had countless people reach out to me through email and social media with heartfelt anecdotes of how the undying love and bond between Stoney and his father made them want to have better relationships with their own parents or their own children. Even I can't help but think to myself that if this man can love the father whose life was as turbulent and misguided as Billy Burt's was, then there's hope for any relationship that may have gone astray or could use a little TLC. I hear people coming in and telling me, you know, they're having troubles and their father and the podcast helped them you know i had a guy was like he said uh he hadn't talked to his dad in like three years and he's like i heard that podcast he's like man after it was done he called him up but it's not the podcast i can't take credit for that it's the story that stoney shared with us all because once you peel back the layers it's not just about a dixie mafia hitman it's about love and trust redemption and forgiveness it's, a, it's actually affecting people's life. And when you think about it, that's heavy, you know. It's awesome what it is. And I'm, I'm so glad that people can listen to this and, you know, get something from it, like where they can change their whole life and they can make that phone call to their dad. I mean, that's what it's about. And uh, they got to see the family side of my grandfather. I think that that's going to touch a lot of people because he was a good, good grandfather. A lot of advice he gave me uh, was good advice. And like he said, son, he said, always keep your word if you give it. He said, if you don't keep your word to somebody, if your word's no good, you're no good. He said, remember that. Stone has seen a change in his own father as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've, I've seen a, a big change in him. I think what this uh, has done is showed him a side of people that that he didn't know existed. Him able to uh, get that off his, you know, tell his dad's story. Because when you Google my grandfather, you only came up with one thing. And uh, it was that horrible crime. And that's, that's one-sided, really, because that's all people had to go by. And uh, now they have uh, the whole story, and now they can make their own opinions. And I think that right there and my dad's mind has just been life-changing for him. And that's, that means everything to him, because that's what the book, 10 years ago when he wrote it, that's what he was setting out to do. And to let his grandchildren know that his, uh, their grandfather wasn't just a killer. And there was more to him than that. And this is uh, not only out there forever now for the grandchildren, but for everybody. And uh, it's just changed, changed all of us, really in a good way. I can't tell you if life will continue on this good for Stoney, but things seem to be on the right track. While Stoney may be an open book with his emotions now, when we first met, getting personal details about his life, especially those that made him feel uneasy or that he was uncomfortable talking about, was no easy feat. When we sat down for our first interview, he looked at me dead in the eyes and said as bluntly as he could, don't ask me how my father died, because I'll never tell you. And don't ask me about my mother. He made me give him my word that I would never press him on these two topics. And I never did. 
His opening up to me about his father's suicide was on his own terms. We've talked about it. And Stoney says that it was his meeting with Cindy Sylvie and the other relatives of the Flemings that changed his mind in the end. That family, that grace, they made me understand that all of us are weak. When I blocked out the 78 meeting with my dad for 30 something years and it come to us, we cried for two hours. You ain't supposed to teach men not to cry for, under no condition. I'm so glad I remembered it three years before we died, because except for my wife being married to me, no woman would have known. I had to wonder that I dreamed that. The 78 meeting that Stoney refers to is when he spent eight hours alone with his father in his prison cell in 1978, thinking he was to be executed the following morning. The two didn't speak of that again for nearly 30 years, having seemingly blocked it out of their minds. I'm thankful like that come back to me. I now know that God gives you a shot mechanism to file things, but Sean, here's what really, really done it. And it just come to me lately. It just surprised me, I blocked it out. Superman. The greatest man that ever lived, my dad. It was too painful for him, and he blocked it out. And that m- made him more human. I, di- I didn't know I needed that to justify my feelings for him. Nothing, I didn't need nothing to justify it, but God did it help me for him to find something so painful. That strong mighty man got the. I still think what was on water blocked out. And that's, and that's great that family showed me. Made me know that none of us are strong or weak. It's, it's, it comes from God, your high power, whatever. And if they can have me in their house, not knowing whether or not I'm man, to this day, they don't know, they know what they think. It made me know that the power to be able to talk about something. It's, uh, I don't know how to put it. It's something that, like that, comes from God. It don't come from you. So when you ask, that's what you did, it's great. I knew I was going to try, and I know I was going to do it. I'm so glad I did. That's, that's a blessing of my life. And it come from God, but it started with that family. Because that's where I seen more church than any church I've been in. You can believe that. Now, I don't know what they think in their hearts. I know how they treat me, what they said to me, but no matter what they think in their hearts, they thought he'd done it. That makes them even more human for the grace they showed. But there's one question people have for Stoney more than any other when they meet him. One question that I guess has intrigued people so much that they just have to know. The main reason for my most recent visit to the distillery and for this episode is that I received a phone call from Stoney last March and he said to me, Sean, I'm ready to talk about my mother. From Imperative Entertainment, this is In the Red Clay. When Stoney called me and said he was finally ready to talk about his mother and the rest of his family and why he'd kept quiet on the subject throughout the duration of our podcast, of course I jumped at the chance. I was just as curious as everyone else. Even as Stoney and I had gotten closer and become friends over the past two years, he still never brought it up, and I dared not ask. I want to know what had changed his mind, and his explanation was rather simple. A lady coming here from, I don't know where she went from Widener. And she asked me about family. Why didn't I talk about my mother? And I try to get by with saying, sometimes a man or woman revert to who they were. And she said something to the effect of, that might be good for you, but you have told a lot of people about your father. Don't you think it's rather unfair for you to refuse? There's a lot of people spent invested time in you. And I felt like a piece of shit. Now, this woman was about 65 years old, very intelligent, way above my pay grade. That worked on me and worked on me for about two or three hours, and I called you. Look, that's why I do. I knew she was right, so I called you. That's why I am from a hip, you know? 
I already knew I was uh, doing wrong. I already knew it. She just made me feel more ashamed. And like, how much did it take for you, boy? I felt like if it was God, that's what he said. You dumbass, how much did it take? You want me to send those old ladies to talk to you? At the beginning of the series, I explained that we were going to refer to Stoney's mother as Jenny. But in truth, her name... Ruby. Ruby Nell, who married Billy Burt, Ruby Nell Lee Burt. Everything else in our story concerning Ruby, save for her name, was true. Though Stoney did leave some parts of the story out, which he now felt compelled to share with me. That's my mother, formerly known as Mom. Still known as Mom, but we haven't talked in 11 years. She spoke to Stoney in 11 years. 11 years, how do you not speak to a grandchild in 11 years? i tell you how. It's having Cain, Abel, jealousy, and the vengeance of hell in your heart. I hate to say it, I can't comprehend it, but that was my mother. 11 years without speaking to Stoney or Stone. That's hard for me to comprehend. It seems that there's much more than meets the eye concerning their relationship. What happened? But when I ask him why he didn't want to speak about his mother or brothers and sisters initially, I begin to see that just underneath this new, jovial surface of Stoney's, he's still a bit raw. Two reasons. I respect my father because if he were alive right now, he'd be telling me, stop, stop now, don't do this. Other reason was, in spite of everything, I love my mother. I don't want to cause her any embarrassment, anguish, or grief. That being said, I want to stop her in the tracks from causing harm, okay, in my family. I want to stop her in the tracks from causing harm. When I say that, I can't talk to my brothers and sisters because she has poisoned them. She has poisoned them because she's got that Cain Abel spirit. And I think, Sean, in the way she looks at me as my father, I've always felt this. I was a daddy's boy, you know. I've always felt it. But what does Stoney mean when he says that she looked at him as his father? I think when she looks at me sometimes, she sees him and gets mad. I know this. I know how I felt about my mother before my father got locked up. I know how I feel about her now. Anytime a child, especially a boy child, walks away from a mother or father, there's a damn good reason if ain't drugs involved. That should have been enough for people, but it's not. It's not. I have so many people ask me in the most humble way, and I've been so cold to them. So I want to put it out there, let the balls fall where they may. People can call me every dirty thing in the book, but I owe it to my grandchildren, to my mother, to my father, to myself, and to everybody who has spent a dollar on one of them books or spent 12 hours listening to your podcast to answer some basic questions that all these people are asking me in the best way I can without hurting anyone and hope they'll leave it alone and let my memories be mine. Is that okay? Stoney used the phrase Cain and Abel jealousy, which I didn't really understand. So I asked him to elaborate on that. The jealousy like I was when I was first met this beautiful creature I called Linda. A man look at the butt, I'd knock him out. That's jealous. There's another kind of jealousy. Your neighbor sees you get a Cadillac, he don't even know you be. He hates you damn good. He wants to burn your house down because you're doing well and he's not. That's Cain Abel jealousy. A lot of families know that. Now you mix that with drugs and you got hell. Now, my mother's never done drugs, my knowledge. But she is the epitome of Cain Abel jealousy. She has went back and forth between me and my brothers and sisters and told how awful my father was and how awful I am. To the point that my two younger ones, my, my two older know better. They're in Wisconsin. I love them. We get along, but not really. A little bit of her has rubbed a long way. A woman can tell. A little bit of her has rubbed a long way. If I had to analyze what Stoney's saying here, I think that part of what he means is that he feels his mother is or was jealous of the close relationship that he and his father had. Or maybe she's just reminded of his father and the horrible crimes he committed when she looks at him. He's also saying that his mother spoke negatively to her other children about his father, which, as you can guess, would cause a rift between Stoney and, well, anyone. So that might help to explain some of the animosity. But it must go deeper than that to not speak to each other for more than a decade. 
I want to go back to the beginning, Stoney's childhood, before things went sour. I asked what it was like behind the Burt's front door when he was growing up. Oh, we were truly happy. There was no hidden slaps in the face or voice raising. Inside our home, it was leave it to be. Our home was our building. And my mother didn't have to turn her head from nothing. Truly, it was like leave it to beaver in my household. No matter what he'd done, he was still a great dad. And she was a wonderful mother and a wonderful wife. They come no better. I remember one time she got me to cut grass. She said, if you'll do this, I'll give you Hank Williams album. I love Hank Williams. Well, she couldn't find Hank Williams. She said, you give me Hank Snow. Now, Hank Snow button is down, button right up the top. And I had a fit. I said, he looks crazy. <laughs> But she taught me to take the album. <laughs> we had a wonderful childhood. It seems that Stoney continues to hold on to this idealized version of his childhood. From all that he's shared with us, it was far from the Leave It to Beaver that I know of. But those good memories are the things Stoney clings to. And maybe that helps him to reconcile with the parts of his childhood he'd rather forget. But I know that there's one big question that everyone, including myself, wants to know. Ruby had to know what Billy Burt was doing, right? We all knew. It wasn't an issue. It was everybody was conditioned. You didn't take your business into the street. You didn't go to school and talk about him peeling the safe in the backyard the night before, take a bullet out of a guy. Mom didn't discuss that temporary parties. People knew. And most people were involved in Mr. Man in ways like sugar. It was a different era, but it was a, a traumatic, what's that saying, soprano type thing. But just because you're all conditioned, how was she really able to just go along with all this? Look, if an 11 year old boy could put the pieces together, Ruby certainly could. The whiskey and bootlegging is one thing, Hell, it was pretty much just accepted at the time as a way of life in the South. But black beauties, staying up for days at a time, not coming home for days at a time, and people that your husband does business with constantly coming up missing or dead, did she just not care? If it was not, I didn't know until the year she left him for Harold Chancey. You heard that right. Ruby left Billy Burt after he had been in prison for several years, for his old moonshine partner and Dixie Mafia cohort, Harold Chansey. I just had to get out of prison. I got out in December 79. I sat in the visitor and heard her laughing, telling him the night he blew Charlie Martin's head off, right outside the window, five foot from her, and she laid down and went to sleep. Now, Charlie Martin was in a certain nightclub, and the man who owned the nightclub said, Billy, that's something you got to go once you take care of it. It's when you want it, as soon as you can. Charlie, give him a ride to the house. We get mother car, some cyclo won't crank. He pulls up, pulls right to the side of the house. My mother opens the window to look out. Bam! Load his head off right there in the car, his own car. And lays down and go to sleep. Now I hear her telling him this as a joke. I had to rethink my mother. It took me about 30 years. And during that time, I was able to see her in a different light. And I was ashamed of myself for the thoughts I was having. There was no deception. You get it? When I went to him and warned him about the boots, I was warning him about a damn murder I know what he'd done in my heart. When my mother back down, she knew that's where her money come from. And believe me, she could say, I like that bedroom, so she'd have it. I like the car, she'd have it. She didn't care. Damn loads of money kept coming through. It's a little hard to understand Stoney here. The more uncomfortable he gets, the faster he talks. And the more he squirms in his chair. But basically, he's saying that even at 11 years old, when he warned his father that a schoolmate had seen the cement blocks and wire coat hangers in the trunk of his father's car, he knew that his father had committed the murder of Jim Dawes. And if he knew, his mother surely did. But as long as the money kept coming in, she had fine cars, jewelry, and the like. She didn't ask questions. And it's truly hard to fathom. Ruby had to have known that Stoney was aware of his father's dealings because they spent so much time together. 
It was me and him, right. and that's all there were. No other brother or sister ever went with him unless we went swimming together. My mother never went with me and him unless we went together to a dance or a show. It was always me and him partying, me and him, me and him. And as for Stoney's siblings, he says they knew nothing of what their father really was doing. As far as they knew, he ran a pool hall, and that was it. They were all too young. Not a clue. Never. No. They were too young. And mom didn't tell them. Yeah. She wasn't a witch. She wasn't evil. No, they had no clue. She was too young. There's three years difference between my brother and sister. There's me, the oldest. Three years, my sister. Three years, my brother. Three years, mother, sister. Three years, my baby brother. It's the two on the end that had been totally screwed up by my mother's actions. I wondered why Stoney was the only one of his siblings who was brought into this world of his father's criminal dealings. I mean, he was a child, too but not to my dad. He right. meant to make me him without the bad stuff. And I think he loved me. He wanted to keep me with him. I feel it. I asked Stoney if he resents his mother for allowing things to go on this way when he was a child. I don't have to think about that. To say no would be a statement. Uh, yes, I guess I got resent. I resent her making my other brothers and sisters hate me. I resent her toting tales between us, tell them how awful I talked to her. I've never disrespected my mother or any other woman. I resent them telling her how my dad didn't support them. I resent her using every one of my brothers and sisters, including me, getting their paychecks, their unemployed. She is the epitome of a Dracula. Replace the blood with money. Diving deeper into Stoney's childhood memories seems to explain just a bit more about the discord between him and his mother. When my father got picked up, over the next three years, my father's only goal was to get her money, massive amounts of money. He sent me to Ray Rush Grave where I got a sack of money under the headstone. When Stoney says he retrieved a sack of money from under a headstone, he's referring to money his father buried at Ray Burt's grave, just underneath the large headstone. He sent young Stoney to retrieve several stashes like this to give to his mother, so she and the family were taken care of financially while he was in prison. Took to a man in Athens, I won't call his name, no need to. He washed it for 75 cents on a dollar. He sent me a number of places. He called Bobby Lee Cook and told him he was wanting to kill the Matthews. He had them give my mother 2000 He killed two men in federal penitentiary who extort one of his friends who was about to make pro for them to send my mother $10,000. This went on and on and on. My mother was spending money like a bat out of hell. She was like myself. We were raised not to respect money. You don't get that out of a wrong person. Money means nothing to you. It didn't my mother. She had the first microwave, $4,000, that was bought in Winder, Georgia. We had the best of the best. Well, in 1980, you know, my dad had been gone for, for six years. When, he, when dad left, Harold quit whiskey for good because whiskey was out anyway because of sugar. And without my dad, them sugar truck being hijacked, it was a lost cause. So he went into hauling marijuana and pills, and that became cocaine. Now, he done real well. There's a couple men right here in this town that are me here because of them. But they had no sense to do it one time. That's all I'll say about that. After Billy was given the death penalty and sent to federal prison, the Dixie Mafia disbanded. And after a while, whiskey was no longer as profitable as it once was. So Harold Chansey moved into dealing the drugs of choice in the 70s and 80s, pot, and eventually cocaine. In 1980, he was arrested because it got messed up. The cocaine wasn't done it. He was stupid enough on cocaine to burn down two houses in one night that he owned and his mother owned. And he was stupid enough to let Ruth, three months before that, raise the insurance double on both of them. One was the house we lived in the state of them, where Middle Beach Twist was shot. The other was a house in Monroe where some black people out of New York had moved in and Ruth. Did. In 1976, the Chanseys apparently wanted the two houses burned for the insurance money. Ruth had recently upped the policy considerably. 
But James Thomas and his family, a wife and five young children, refused to leave the house when Ruth tried to evict them without cause. So she wanted them gone. Well, they told her to go to hell. So, in the cocaine stupor, I guess he was, because he was too smart to do this. And one night, both houses got burnt with gasoline, with five black children were burnt up. That went over like a lead balloon. Now, I know Harold didn't mean to do that, but he'd done it. Him and whoever helped him. And I know he would not hurt a child. I know they wouldn't press this. He worked most of the black people. He never used the N-word. But it happened. On October 11th of that year, the five Thomas children, ranging in age between five and 10 years old, were killed in the firebombing. Now during the trial, which was the biggest trial of Monroe history, it was even, it was right up the Lorenz trial. My mother made it her job to help her. And I was thinking, damn mom, you don't even know him. I didn't want to think what I was thinking. Within six months I knew. She fought her way into the prison cell to be with him. She was attracted to him. If it had been another man, a decent man, I don't believe I judge, I don't believe it broke my heart. But damn, my father in prison sent her all this money and she fights her way into Harold Chance's life and takes my baby brother and sister to see him for the next th almost four years. To this day, their mind is screwed up. And I hold it against her. What mother does that? A Ruth Chancy. There's more than one Ruth Chancy or Ruben L. Lee's out there, Sean. And those who hear me right now are relating. Men aren't only bad people on earth. Women are too. So hell, some kids are. Bad's bad. I have protected her so long from my father. I ain't noble. I didn't do it for her sake, nothing for his. If I have to over again, I still do it. I wouldn't tell him nothing. Stoney never told his father about the affair of sorts between his mother and Harold Chancy to protect him from being hurt. And by this time, Ruby had all but stopped visiting Billy Bird in prison, wasn't taking the other children to see him either. She was taking them instead to see Harold. She never came to see him again until a camera was put on it, like the baptism. <laughs> you let a camera be there, she'd break her neck get in front of the camera. And my dad would have lied for the kids. He wanted so badly for the kids to see what he left behind because it felt so guilty because that all happened because of his dumb ass. And he was right. He never said that. I knew that. I feel that way. But now, as a 15 year old child looking at both of them indifferently, you see it different. Now I'm 61. And I tell you the truth, I don't see it no damn differently at all. I see my daddy as a cold blooded killer. I see my mother as a cold blooded user of people a professional at it, including me. I wasn't supposed to be supporting my mother at 16. Hell, I had issues, but she made me feel like, I found a letter one time she had wrote to my dad. She was saying, honey, I, he works all week. He gives all his money to that whore. I'm 15 year old man and Linda just met and I'm making $200 at the Huddle House. And I'm thinking, why would she make my dad feel ill at me? But I know when he got it, all he did was probably cry at the, at the pelvis of it. But me and him never spoke of it. For all the progress Stoney seems to have made with figuring out and comprehending the events of his unusual life, there's still work to be done. Clearly, there is still a huge amount of animosity held against his mother and even a few of his siblings. He keeps in touch from time to time with a few of them, and they stay cordial for the most part, though he seems to be closer to his brothers, Montana and Shane, the youngest of the Burt children. But in his final thoughts on all this, Stoney lets it fly when I ask him what his feelings are towards his mother and any other members of his family that he may hold a grudge against at this point. So who am I hiding from, Sean? The whole town knows it. Let the damn world know. Let the son of bitches call me a son of a bitch. I can take it. But I'd be goddamn if they're going to hurt him anymore. 
He's paid his price. He's with his maker. He has admitted everything he's ever done. Leave him the hell alone. Come at me. I'm alive, you son of a bitches. We'll go and debate any time and hook up to a lie detector test about who's a piece of shit. What more can you say? That's the way I feel. I think you've said all there is to say, Stoney. As for unanswered questions in this podcast, I think we all have a clear idea of why Stoney initially declined to speak of his mother. But maybe she'll hear this and understand a little bit more about why he has these feelings of resentment. And who knows, maybe they'll reconcile one day. But for now, Stoney will keep on just being Stoney. Joyful, funny, loving, bitter, and resentful. And as complex as ever. Just the way we like him. In the Red Clay is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and created the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Produced and engineered by Shane Freeman, Jason Hoke, and myself. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Voice sessions recorded at Tree Sound Studios, Atlanta, Georgia. Archival footage licensed courtesy of Brown Media Archives, University of Georgia, and WSB-TV in Atlanta, Georgia. In the Red Clay is a 12-episode series with new episodes available every Tuesday. Follow us on Instagram at In the Red Clay Podcast. Have questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. If you like the show, tell your friends and leave us a review. Thanks for listening.